Okay, everybody. I have something really cool to tell you about. If you haven't heard yet about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain here. It's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will uh, distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one single place. Now, the way that you can do this is you got to download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm and then you can get started. It's really fun. We just switched over recently here at All Too Real 2 and I'm enjoying it so far. So be sure to check it out and uh, let us know what you think. Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of All Too Real 2. My name is Michael E. Colin II, and with me via Facebook Messenger is... Matthew Haas. Yes, my cohort in (laughs) podcasting. In sadness, oh. And sadness. (laughs) <laughs> merriment and everything um yes the um <laughs> today we have a very special episode we have an interview with uh character actor and leading actor on stage and screen um lee ehrenberg who uh people may know from the pirates of the caribbean films where he played pintel I think that's how you say it. Pintel? Pintel? I yeah, I think so. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the crew members for Captain Barbosa. Um, you'll remember him as the guy that said, uh, hello, puppet. You know, that guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, you've got, uh, he was in TV show Once Upon a Time recently as Leroy, a.k.a. Grumpy. And, <laughs> um, He's been in a bazillion things. Uh, helped uh, help start the uh, the actors gang out in uh, California with Tim Robbins and other uh, other well known actors um, that he's worked with from time to time too in movies such as Tapeheads and Bob Roberts. Uh, he has a very insightful look on life. It was, it was great talking to him. I I could have talked to him for another like four or five hours but (laughs) i like to keep the show at less than an hour or so you know so i don't know what's your favorite lee aaron burke character matt i don't know don't know you like them all pretty much yeah i like him as me is that grumpy on once upon a time just because (laughs) I'm obsessed. Yeah, with it's a great. I'm obsessed with that TV show at the moment. It's a no, it is a great show. It really is. Yeah. <clears throat> but anyways, uh, here's the uh, interview with the Ehrenberg. How are you tonight? Uh, you know, man, I'm. You know, I'm all right. I'm going through some shit, but uh, eh? you know, my mom's not well. So oh, that's 92. not good. 92, though, like a great run. Yeah. Not just dealing 
with kind of that, that end of the life, honoring her wishes, uh, get some good visits. And now COVID too, like on that, the COVID flavor uh, yeah. in her, basically she's in assisted living. Well, it's independent living, but now assisted. And uh, yeah, man, it's a schlep. It's a, uh, for me, it's a, uh, I live up on the beach now, if not in LA. So I'm, a, I'm about 70 miles from where I grew up. So it's like a 150 mile run, which is great for thinking and chilling, but it's, ch- I love my mama, mama's boy, dude. So, <laughs> like, you know, life, life, it's life and it's death. It's part of the life. Um, That's great. Which, yeah, yeah. Whenever I come back from those visits, I'm always like, you know, I do about three a week. My brother does some and the family, right? So yeah. some are good, some are bad, you know, and today was sort of in between, you know. Yeah, 92 is a long run, though. That's- yeah, it's challenging. I lost my dad seven years ago and uh, he went fast, though. So like it was like it's just gone. And so that there was a poignancy to that uh that uh i don't know there's just something about the just went to sleep took a nap and boom and beautiful to have the martini the night before you know whatever <laughs> 80 so um yeah but but people in my my grandma lived to 100 certain there's le- there's longevity in my family so it's always interesting i just want to honor i want to honor how cool a mom i had you know and uh it's challenging because I want to go there a lot of times to just like cry, you know, like a little kid, <laughs> you know, like whatever. Yeah. I, I, I only play tough guys on TV, bro. I'm really like, that's all, <laughs> really all fucking bullshit. A teddy yeah. bear heart or... <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I like to think I'll take that. Yeah. You know, bears are cool. Bears are real cool. Yeah. You're not really sure if they're going to be Yogi Bear or Grizzly Bear, right? I love bears. I like bears. I like wolves. I like ravens. I love nature. I'm really, I'm really, uh, you know, appalled at what we do to our environment. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that whole thing, like for me, like I come from a family of people that like, you know, use math or use science. Obviously I didn't, but I come from that kind of people. <laughs> you know? So to not believe science. Oh, I know. To take us back to like Galileo to like, you know, Fauci is Galileo or whatever, you know, and it's, and it's still political and Machiavellian and it's just what interesting times, very Shakespearean times, the, uh, the times of the quarantine. I know uh, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's something you would, would never expect, but you know, eventually it was going to happen. I mean, now where are you, bud? Where are you located? Uh, Ohio, Toledo. Yeah, Ohio. So that's like, you know, that's like one of probably, you know, that's the hotbed of a lot of this stuff. Yeah. I'm flipped. I'm flipped about what I see in Ohio. Yeah, I mean, our governor was doing decent at first, and then I think he kind of uh, fed into the like, let's open everything up. Because Mike DeWine is your governor, right? Mike Correct. DeWine. Yeah. DeWine. Yeah. He 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 stood up. Originally, he stood up for the people. I mean, I'm just saying, like to me. Yeah. For my mind, we're at over two hundred thousand people dead. We have. Four percent of the world population and over twenty percent of the casualties. Just that alone is disqualifying. Uh-huh. That we should have four percent. Yeah, we should have four percent. We have four percent of the population. We should have four percent max. Yeah, it's that should be what we're talking about. And I don't. That would be thirty, forty thousand, and that's still too many. And then you, all these people buying into the conspiracy theories and all that bullshit yeah. about you know oh masks well, don't work ma- whatever they yeah they do <laughs> actually you know today because we're now we're approaching the flu season and apparently you know if 95 percent of us in this country would just wear wear the mask um it would save probably a hundred thousand lives between now or 200 between now and the end of the year we're actually going to double our death rate uh potentially in the next just three months with this flu shit so um yeah i just wish people cared more about other people yeah i mean that that's That's all that's the thing i mean the the thing with the mask masks is you're you're protecting other people not yourself and people don't but then the whole society like it's it's that's one right yeah and then for me like the fact that you know we have a society where we treat we say all men are created equal and maybe that's true if you're a white man yeah. Like you and me. Right. Um, but it doesn't mean women are. I don't know. I don't think so. I want it to be. I think the better. I mean, to me, the better gender. They 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 create the people. They can women do everything we do. 
and they make the babies. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know. Maybe I'm just, uh, I, I believe in the, the one thing um, I feel real grateful to do what I get to do. Right. And then, but the golden rule is what I try to live by to treat other people the way I want to be treated. Yeah. Do others. It's real simple, you know, it's and that, that way you can treat religion. someone with respect. Yeah. That, yeah, I was say don't that. you think? I mean, I saw that you, you know, that the high faith and, yeah. and, and, the, and, and of course, you know, of course it's the essence of, I mean, uh, the essence of it. I travel, I used to, my wife used to sell Moroccan rugs, right? So we'd make forays into Morocco and I was shocked. I'd never been in a Muslim country, uh, and I learned a lot the very first trip and then the second trip and the third trip and the more <laughs> trip uh, about their hospitality. I'm Jewish, bro. You know, so I felt like I was, you know, they're just brothers of a different tribe. Yeah. We're tribal. This is what's happening in our country now. We're tribal. Fandom in, 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 uh, in conventions is very tribal. Right. What's your cosplay? Yeah. You know, what <laughs> what group are you a superhero group? Are you a you know, right? Yeah. I mean, the tribalism is important to humans. It's what we do when we get scared. But yeah, I mean, when we get scared, all tribes are and the, all tribes have connections, though. I mean, that's the thing we got to realize <laughs> that we yeah, are, yeah. And there's yeah. positives about that. Yeah, there's positives because we're all cool. Mm -hmm. We're all great. My point is, I celebrate. I celebrate coolness in every culture because that's how you grow and learn and wow you know as artists you know we want to be loving and supportive and have a message of no ego right i mean it's hard to do that but that's the aspiration sure. you know to be able to be generous when you're in a lineup with a bunch of great actors i mean any one of these people can be the star mm -hmm. any one of them can care a lot you know i'm a character they call me a character actor i'm but i'm an actor that plays characters yeah, I just don't. I'm just short, bald, and crazy looking. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. I am too. So, <laughs> yeah, buddy, come on. You know, but we're capable of romantic love. We're capable of of uh, of anger. We're capable of being funny. So, but I mean, it's just where does the story go? What you yeah. know? In my game, it's the story I follow, and you know, in. Uh, in politics, I mean, obviously now politically we're a cult of personality and stuff too. It's what a world, but it's very Shakespearean. You know, I could see, you know, out of these turbulent times, great art coming out. Oh, for sure. You know, end of the day, the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm rewriting a political thriller that I was short that I was shooting before COVID, and then uh, rewriting it to include the COVID stuff to kind of make sense. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. And it, I mean, the thing is, it's like the main thing with that, I think that's bothering. I, I don't like the whole two party system is kind of like a, like sport. No. Way. It's like, it's like, you know, two football. Teams well, George Washington, yeah. George, yes, George Washington. If you look at his, uh, farewell address, he addresses the, that issue mm -hmm. when he left, they wanted him to stay forever president. Yeah. Right. Cause he was good. And he was, you know, people dug George Washington and, he is the one that set the precedent for a uh, peaceful transition of power. And he warned that a two party system will always be a war yeah. by its very nature, because you don't have any coalitions to build. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to pull You're trying to pull from you. You have to appease your base. And then in the general campaign, run to the middle, mm -hmm. you know, that's it. Because, I mean, the thing is, like, one party could say, oh, you do this and it'll solve all the problems in the world. But because the other party didn't come up with it, they're not going to agree. Right. And that's ridiculous. We should be like, we should all citizens be going, can we go with the best ideas, please? Yeah. It doesn't matter who thinks of them, for fuck's sake. Let's, <laughs> we're all in it together. I think the middle class has taken a dump. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the only people that have gotten wealthy in the pandemic are the rich people. Yeah. That's a problem for me. I'm struggling as a middle class actor. Yeah, through the pandemic, I, I mean, I mean, I've been lucky. I have a full time job. I work at a Walmart, but um, you know, it's it's a full time job to at least keep my uh, bills paid. <laughs> you know, while, while well, I mean, do anything else. I live in I don't I live in a town that's where Walmart is my spot. I was there the other day. Yeah, and so yeah, I get it. I mean, I'm not against Walmart. 
No, I understand what they're doing. It's too late to like fight that battle. Oh yeah, for sure. We're talking about they're a major employer, mm -hmm. um, and they have fucking everything. Yeah, I can get paint to paint a painting. I can go and I found makeup to do for my theater stuff. I do mm -hmm. a little vampire kid. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was like, tell him like, geez, holy, <laughs> I need some charcoal toothpaste. Come on. <laughs> yeah, um, all in one place, I and mean, I get it. You know. And the mom and pop got squeezed for sure. Oh, yeah. But I'll still support the mom and pops when I buy a bike oh, or yeah. when I go eat food or when I want to support my neighborhood sandwich shop. I want these guys in business. Oh, yeah. A liquor store. Yeah. I try to eat at local restaurants as much as I can because that's. I like your good. style, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, just just a little bit about, I mean, because you've been acting for a long time and stuff. And I just, you know, want to. You know, how'd you get started in acting? Just so, you know. Well, the you know, listening. yeah, I mean, the, my, st I started in school, you know, uh, my start, I was like a child, child actor, like theater, theater kid in school. And that was my start. Uh, so my, I had, but I grew up in Santa Monica, California. So like my, the people I grew up with, in, especially in high school, were all the young movie stars of the future. Right. And so it was also, my goal was always to be on film and TV just to be a professional actor. I mean, I'm kind of like do it all. I like, I like, there's nothing better than doing theater for the immediate gratification, for the connection to the other artists, uh, for the control of the project that you get when you do theater. That's the actor's medium. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So starting in, uh, in, uh, school, then I went to college for it. And in at UCLA, got together with a bunch of other young actors and formed a theater company called the Actors Gang. And that was my sort of foray into the professional, semi-professional world as we started doing shows outside of college in Hollywood. Uh, real punk rock theater. This was like 1981. Okay, it's going back a ways. And um, we were a young, we were a sensation. We were a sensation. Um and out of the actors gang, I mean, Tim Robbins is the artistic director. Tim was like my older brother in college. He's still like my, I mean, he's my older brother now, but he was a senior when I was a freshman. But, but our company's also produced, uh, um, Jack Black and Kyle Gass and the Tenacious D, the whole thing and myself and a number of other working professional actors, right? So, um, and meanwhile, we've also in, especially in the early days, we were a kind of like a, place it was like a hangout for young hollywood so johnny cusack jeremy piven a lot of chicago actors uh, are connected to kind of the, the the work that i did as a young actor and um and that's what kind of launched me in in professional in making films and in, in, in television as at 23 i sort of got my first agent and started landing my first jobs first in professional theater um and then in uh, January of 1987, I got my first movies. And the first one I ever did was called Tape Heads. Um, a lot of my early stuff, I mean, I owe a lot yeah. to my career to Tim, to Tim Robbins yeah. uh, and my association with Tim and then Cusack as well. Um, we, we, I, I felt like, you know, they used to call me Beef. That was my nickname. <laughs> so I, I'm very much like, did you ever watch that show Entourage? Yeah. So I'm kind of like Turtle. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> I ran with some fast people. I ran with some fast people and uh, in the best of ways, you know, um, I was a baller though. I usually in the theater, I usually was the, you know, I played a lot of leading roles in the theater from 65 year old uh, Pentecostal preachers to megalomaniacs buying and selling the world to uh, a fix it shop technician needing homemade electroshock therapy to recover his life, you know, and everything in between. And that, and that, and that, that's what I'm saying about like the capability of a Hollywood character actor. You know, I'm playing lead deep roles in the, on the stage and I may not be challenged exactly the same way, but I have a color to bring a, a, a responsibility. Maybe I'm an obstacle to the lead character on a TV show or uh, that's most likely I'm hired to be an obstacle in a scene or in a, in an episode. Uh, I mean, and the thing is, is, I mean, there's nothing, I mean, I think with, with character actors, you have more of a longevity than I think uh, leading actors sometimes too. I think yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't, 
I don't put any, I'm not putting any judgment on it because I think the style and the style of storytelling now has become much more realistic where, I mean, I, I look like a person so I could be the dad. I have a kid. I'm saying I have children. I, you know what I mean? I've experienced being with girls before I have, um, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. I'm a man, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's life experience. It's like, you don't just have to be six foot and gorgeous. You can yeah. be unique now. We're giving credit to these unique actors and stuff. So, but, but um, a lot of credit, of course, in Hollywood goes to the great casting directors that see the theater, that pay attention, that see what's going on and having good relations with them through, you know, them coming and supporting the theater when I was young really helped me and uh, got me going, you know, and it's a big part of it is it's a team game. It's a team sport. Do you uh, prefer theater or, uh, or, or film and, and TV? I prefer film and TV. Do you? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, you get paid better. Mm -hmm. More people see your work. Yeah. Um, It's a bit more exciting to travel. I also, what I really like about the requirements of the acting is it's forever. You get one fucking crack at it. Yeah. So you have to be ready on the day to execute that scene you're working on. Mm -hmm. Right. In theater, we, you know, although my acting coach, I study acting. I take class every week. I'm constantly working as a student, not, you know, I'm learning. Uh, and one of my goals that I work on with my teacher is that every take is different, always fresh, right? And so there's something really exciting about that in film, the capturing of that moment of uh, we're blowing this pirate ship up. We're going to explode this. Can you please clear before we blow that? Be funny right here. Run over there. Sword fight that zombie. Um, and you get one crack at it. Yeah. You know, so you rehearse, you rehearse for days, weeks, whatever it is. And then can you execute it? Yeah. Can you be calm under pressure? Can you be funny under pressure? Can you cry under pressure? Right. Of, of them jamming a camera in your face and a hundred <laughs> crew going like, I am ready for lunch when you get this again. Yeah. And you the know? thing, I mean, like you said, film is forever too. It's like, you know, it's going to be there it's forever. I can still remember. Yeah. I can remember. Watching a film for me, I can remember what lunch was a lot of the time, where the catering was, what my trailer looked like, <laughs> what jacket. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, it's weird. It's it triggers deep sense memory. Where and some of the theatrical memories I can I can yeah. recall. Um, but being you know on stage is a bit more like being uh, in rock and roll. The the audience and the relationship and you know it's it's much more of an experience to go through. Filmmaking is actually like laborious yeah. and technical. And the key is being able to get there when you need to get there. You know, mm -hmm. some actors need to stay in character all freaking day to get there when they're called. And I respect them for it because, but the deal is with acting, it doesn't matter how you do it, how I do it, how anyone does it. It just matters that that stop all our styles mesh. Yeah. Result oriented business, you know. Y'all have to um, be in the same film. Yeah, yeah. proofs in the yeah. pudding. Yeah. That's it. That's yeah. it. That's it. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. You know that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, folks, this is uh, Michael E. Cullen II um, from the podcast that you're listening to right now, along with Matthew Haas. We just wanted to tell you about our great, great podcast Super. called Super. It's called All Too Real. And on that show, what, what do we do, Matt? We, we watch biopics, and then we talk about whether or not the movie matched up with the real story or not. So we, we, It was a lot we, more exciting than that, though. Yeah, so, 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 so we we analyze the real story and the real story. Get it? Get it? Real. You know? Yeah, they're, they're spelled differently, yeah. folks. You can guess which one I said which way. Uh -huh. Anyways, um, so uh, sometimes we have a guest, sometimes we don't. Um, but we uh, talk about great, sh great, uh, great movies like uh, Shattered Glass yes. and The Social Network and... Uh, a futile and stupid gesture, among others. Um, those are some of the ones that we've covered so far, and uh, we're going to cover a lot more. So uh, please uh, subscribe on Stitcher, um, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you uh, find your great, fun podcasts. And be sure to share it with your friends. Do it. Do it. Do it. And make sure you're not afraid to get all too, too real. Bye-bye younger self of you if you had any advice to give yourself what would it be i mean advice? don't take it so seriously don't be such an egomaniac if i can have more fun yeah enjoy the ride have confidence um yeah i mean i i, 
I, I, I think that, you know, I was very confident. I was, but I was scared. I mean, it's a scary game too. Uh, I mean, I, and I don't, I think I've come out, you know, pretty good, yeah. but just now maybe I'm more mellow. I'm a dad. Uh, I have more curiosity with my kid. I'm uh, more realistic about what it takes to, you know, I have a lot of gratitude and I, I realize I've done a lot of stuff yeah. and I'm still real hungry. That's a thing, right? I'm still as hungry now as I've ever been right to get my next. That's so that's what feels good that I'm in still doing it. Thursday nights I'm zooming in this pandemic. I've already done. I did a production basically of uh, we called it zooming for Godot. <laughs> you know, and we rehearsed it. It was based on waiting for Godot about, but basically about four actors waiting for the pandemic to end. You know what I mean? <laughs> Use and I've done a bunch of readings. And now I'm doing a Thursday night kind of salon through my theater company. Well, this group called Cabinet of Oddities that I like produce and um, am part of. And uh, every every week we have a different theme. It's a two hour jam with whoever wants to show up bring a character, bring an image, bring a poem, bring a song, no judgment, no ego, um, something to do. We're all there from coming from love, which, and that doesn't sound corny, but as artists, we're just supporting each other. Just know that you, everyone, if there's 25 people wanting to get on stage, we got to get 25 people on and off in, in two hours. Yeah. So, you know, you know, there's a, there's, and it's, it's been real rewarding and, and maybe it turns into something going down the road because we got it. We're building in a great cast and, uh, a certainly unique style and communicating really effectively through this. Uh, I take acting class on zoom and uh, it's great. It's so perfect. Cause I'll get in, I'll get into like here and play scenes here. <laughs> right. And it's like a, it's like a close up. Yeah. So you're practicing your close up, and depending on how you get it right now, I, I'm in a side by side with you. But if I'm doing a scene with you, I'm pinning your screen. I'll slide mine up to the top or even hide myself for you. Yeah. And then I just can play the scene. Like I'm in, just like we're having a conversation. It's exactly what we do. And then it really translates to, you know, when you watch it back, you go, okay, that's good film acting. You're just living on the freaking screen. It's just like this conversation. Yeah. Film is so personal too. It's like you're right there. <laughs> you're inside there, yeah. dude. Yeah. <laughs> you're inside. Yeah. You're inside the box. Mm -hmm. The goal, as you know, as a filmmaker, is when we get into these close-ups, we're getting psychologically into the character. Yeah. They always talk in film directing, right? Do we start tight and go wide, or do we start wide and go tight? A lot of times, that's how that, you know, you watch major filmmakers, they'll, they'll tell the story just either wide to tight or tight to wide. Yeah. It has nothing to do with what's in the script. It's just how I'm going to say it. Yeah. Starts on a phone, widens out to see the whole room. <laughs> about you know all the president's men you know whatever it is right okay. yeah so as far as like film and tv go what what has been your like one of your favorite roles so far well or, or do you love them all <laughs> i mean i love it anytime i get paid and can pay my mortgage or my rent or my car payment or my you know go out and have a sandwich yeah uh, as an actor that's cool so i'm thankful for all my roles yes but I mean, some of my favorites. Uh, did you ever watch Action? Yeah, the that was with Jay Moore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I that was a good. That. Yeah. that was a fun show. That one caught me by surprise. Doing the first uh, full male frontal nudity on network television. Oh wow! <laughs> I mean, that talk about courage. You know what I mean? And um, uh, I needed the job, so I was like, <laughs> whatever. You know, I don't. You're the character, though. Mm -hmm. They they come to you and they go, listen, now, we want you. Would you, you know, take this? And I'm like. Yeah, I, I don't shower with anything on. And they're not going to, it's television. They're going to block it. It's going to be creative. Listen, man, there's only going to be five people in the room with you. And I go, yeah, and a hundred around the monitor. Just let's go. <laughs> they're all like, that, but I was, I, I was a guest star on the pilot, bro. <laughs> Suddenly I'm a regular on the show. Nice. You know what I'm saying? Because the courage of the actor, because we, we, we are the character. We're not, the difference between me and a non-professional actor is that I'm able to get to the place where I forget self mm -hmm. and can get and just be the character. Showing a lot of times ugly stuff that you wouldn't share normally. The stuff that it's interesting, right? The, the characters that are darker or go to the places that uh, sharing some personal 
the darkness, you know, possibly. Right. So that's the beauty of the art is just it, you go there and you inhabit, but you come out it's art, you know, what mm. you're, it's a craftsman. We're not, we're not, they, they, we're members of we're guild members, screen yeah. actors guild. Mm-hmm. So like right, we're craftsmen. Yeah. Way more of a, and if it becomes art, it's because the audience makes it art. The audience was one of the only art forms where as performers, performers are the only people where the audience defines the art performance, music performance, as opposed to, or dance performance, right? People have to watch Yeah, acting for sure. Someone has to watch it's in, it's in, you know, intrinsic in the art that it's actor to audience, right? So the audience defines the art. Like you say to the craftsman, you built a bitch in house. Now that paint job is really good. You can tell the difference. Mm-hmm. I work, I work, my brother-in-law's a contractor. I flip houses yeah. and I work with him. I get enough where I can help on some of his projects doing little stuff. Right. Um, and he always looks in the corners. The corners tell you everything about construction, about painting, about how good the floor job was done. Just look in the corners. If you ever want to buy a property, well, that corner yeah. looks pretty tight. It's going to be good construction. The paint, you know, you go, you, you take your paint. And you sweep. I learned how to sweep from construction. You sweep from the corner of the room to the middle, from the corner to the middle, and then, and then from into the middle of the room. And you, that's how you clean a, clean a construction site, right? And so those kind of stuff for acting, very practical, building a foundation, you know, a, appreciating the costume and, you know, taking care to like work your accent, your dialogue, um, so that when you get on set, you're able to play. Right. You're able to take it somewhere that the other actors, you're open enough to listen to. Like, do, uh, you know, I love, I loved working on Once Upon a Time is my most recent, you know, the yeah. show that I was on. Uh, because you'd be in a scene with Lana Perea, Jimmy Goodwin, Josh Dallas, Robert Carlyle, right? These yeah. are real, these are real actors, right? So the, first of all, it's different all the time. They're changing it up. You got to pay attention. It's never going to be exactly the same. They're, they're actually trying to do it. And that kind of living, you just inhabit. I'm in Granny's. I'm having, yeah. I'm drink. I'm here. I'm drinking a beer, eating some lasagna. There's the curse. The curse. <laughs> you know, it's just real, right? So yeah. Once upon a time's been my latest binge. I'm uh, almost. I, I I didn't watch it when it was on for some reason. Everybody told me, oh, you gotta watch it, and I didn't. But I, I I'm on. Uh, I'm almost done with season six right now. So. <laughs> Yeah, I just that started. Was, I just started a couple of weeks ago, and I've just been. Yeah, it was a fun know, show. I mean, and, and honestly, it it truly like it was big deal for me because it really, you know, it took me up a notch and and uh, another kind of validation. Every time you land a good one, in, as in my kind of level of this game, uh, it just adds more credibility to all the other stuff I did earlier in my career. Yeah, and um, that's what the, the the character actors kind of experience, where you know you get discovered, kind of. Then they go like, you're the guy in Pirates? And I go, thanks. I go, thanks. Yeah. I don't want you to necessarily call that out right away. You know what I mean? It's kind of like so, a, a good special effect. You don't want people to know that it exists. So kind of almost. Well, a lot of people when I did Pirates, they thought it was English or whatever, right? Yeah. You know, so um, yeah, the, a lot of this game is like the mystery of it and, and just enjoying it being grateful how many people get the opportunity to do you know be on be on someone's zoom podcast and discuss like it's you know i mean be i treat people i my rule is really treat the regular people like the superstar treat the superstar like the regular joe Uh because that superstar appreciates it Mm -hmm. you don't kowtow you just go hey man yeah can you throw your plate in the sink bro seriously yeah Yeah, i've We'll say it. I mean, back to once upon a time, it, I I owe that all to my. I just need to say this out here, my niece, because I was over at her place one day playing with her baby, and uh, she had uh, once upon a time in the background, and I'm like, "What the hell is this? This looks good." <laughs> so yeah, you know what? Show. It's yeah. a ah. Well, a lot of our, um, you know, we had a huge following in the 18 to 49 women demographic. It's one yeah. of the reasons why the show was such a juggernaut, and. The main characters that obviously are the most beloved are going to be our princesses and our mm-hmm. princes, right? So Grumpy, he's like the uncle. Mm-hmm. So my, I have great experiences being in the convention world. I was usually a lot of the hosting for Creation Entertainment. I would be the host of the shows. It was fantastic. Um, but there would be the dad or the uncle. Yeah. Brought the niece to the convention. 
and the wide eyed, the kids has the best time of the life of their lives meeting these people like Lana or Emily DeRaven or any number of the great Bex Mader and um, these inspirational actresses. And um, the dad has just got this big smile. And I'm like, yeah, you scored some big dad points, man. Yeah. And I'd always give him thumbs up and, and, and that's cool, you know? Yes, and yeah. so in a lot of ways, a lot of our audience, the dads would be like, I'm a fan of the show. I mean, Rumpel's, <laughs> Rumpel's a badass. He's a coward as you know in, in his previous life, but once he turns to the dark one, he's a scary character. Yeah. <laughs> right? Josh, I mean Prince Charming, great character. Captain Hook, I'm a like, god Colin, like yeah. great great take on a pirate. Between him and Johnny, like two iconic pirate uh characters I got to work with. Yeah. So and they're both totally different, but still yeah. pirates and both, still with both that charisma. Actors. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great actors, but both of them like both of them had the um, interesting thing was right with both of them is they uh, they just have that swag and you know that swagger of like both Colin and, and Johnny are just they're good looking nice just rock star kind of guys both rock star kind of dudes it's like <laughs> it's based Johnny got that right Johnny nailed that with Jack Sparrow he saw pirate as rock star yeah. He made that connection uh, of rock stars of the age. And then, of course, he added the Pepe Le Pew because he's Johnny and very creative, right? So he combined Keith Richards and, and Pepe Le Pew by his own definition to find Jack Sparrow. And honestly, the one of the most, I mean, not since Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, the level of comedy that he nailed on that one is, I think, on that level. Benny and June level, if you ever, I'm a oh, huge yeah. fan of that's one of my favorite movies. I went as a uh, an homage to Buster Keaton, right? Yeah. So yeah, I, I went as Johnny's character from Benny and June one year for Halloween. So yeah, I, <laughs> but there you go. See, I knew, but I see yeah. even reading like your bio and, the, and your whole thing. I was like, this guy knows cinema, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, you're and and that's what it is. All I'm talking about. Yeah. It's like the fans that are cool enough. And the devotees of the art form to, and then filmmakers. That's why we become filmmakers. Yeah. It's because we're fans of the art, uh, a la Quentin Tarantino, a la these, some of the best filmmakers there are. John Cassavetes, some legendary kind of filmmakers that just did their own thing. Um, but it's the, it's the passion of other people's work yeah. that inspires you. Johnny inspired by Buster Keaton and the physical comedy of the silent days and stuff. Yeah. Is there anybody that you haven't worked with yet that you would be interested in working with that you're dying to work with? I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, no. 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 I mean, I don't. The weird. No, because I like I don't want to limit myself by saying, yeah, I I've, there's so many. There's oh, yeah. too many. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. You know, it's kind of like a ridiculous. I could, I could just go off the top of my head, a million actors. I would go, you know, instantly, you know, and I would love to work with everyone I've ever worked with because there's something about the, you know, reuniting. For sure. There's the magic. Of, I'll tell you one of the secrets of once upon a time that when I watch the episodes myself and now on Disney plus, it's super cool that we're now there. Yeah. Um, uh, the other thing about the forever business, about capturing these moments forever in film and TV, the way we do, what you're like on that day, what you had for lunch, what the weather was like, what jokes did the crew tell you that day, right? Uh, how good was the cell phone service on the mountain that day? Whatever it is. Right? Um, it sticks with you. But what translates onto the screen is how the cast relates off the screen. If you were like when Mackenzie and I were assigned to become best buddies by Gore Verbinski, we connected off the screen. We hung out. We were best buddies off the screen and on during those making those movies. And so the love between those two wacky pirates was real of two friends. The same way I could relate to Love and Marty and as crazy as Marty is or Kevin McNally as Gibbs and, you know, and seeing Orlando. Oh, man, thanks for having that great party at your place. And just. The levels of it. Yeah. And then once upon a time, we'd go out to dinner, we'd go go-karting, we'd play golf, we'd have lunch. And so suddenly you're caring about that. And off the screen, me, it says that you care about them on the screen. And so developing relationships is key. So actors I respect, so many. I mean, of my current 
my number one would probably be I'd, I'd like to be in a movie with Javier Bardem. Yeah, he's, he's I just great. love Javier. I, and, you know, he's from No Country to Old Man. I'd like him to be more like that. Did you ever watch Beautiful? Yeah. Right, where he has the cancer and he's the tough guy yeah. and the whole thing. It's like, I'd like to be real in a movie for once where it's just like I get to really throw down my my what I work on in class, character that gets to be real. You know, that would be a dream kind of a role for me to show what I can do, you I'm know, sure. emotionally. I'm sure moments. that'll come. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. you know what? It is it, it's the journey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, I land some sitcom and then I'm I'm happy just making faces. I don't care. Yeah. yeah. Like I said <laughs> earlier, it's like the 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 challenge is to doesn't say writer by my name, it doesn't say director, it doesn't say right producer. I mean it can, I can wear mm-hmm. those hats. Um but when I wear the actor hat, I'm going to... Did you ever see Extras, the old uh, Ricky Gervais show? Oh, yeah. I watched every episode of that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, so when he's on there with um, Ian McKellen and, he's, and Ian is explaining how to act and there he's got the script and he's like, well, dear boy, you it's a thing called the script. You open it up. You find You read it. You find where it says the character, your name. And then you say what it says. Right? <laughs> That's... Like yeah. sometimes we try to do too much. Just just yeah. read the script. It tells you what to do. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it is just mechanical. Sometimes you got to get in there. But that I mean you don't have. You can't get beyond the mechanical unless you have the, like you said before, foundation of what you're. Yeah, you got to have doing. the chops. Yeah, you got to have the chops. You'll get called on it. I mean, yeah. Any any one of us can just stand there and look like something, no. but can. But what's underneath? And you know when you're making and trying to direct actors and yeah. work with actors, trying to coax a performance out of it. Sometimes it's, you know, you can't necessarily say how to say something. You have yeah. to get the, have the feeling underneath. Because it's never, acting is never what you say. It's always how you say it. Yeah. The writing is the what you say. The acting is the how you say. Yeah, because there's a lot of times when you, say something you're not actually saying what you're saying you're saying the subtext of something completely Dude, different the, yeah. uh hello yeah. how do you make a million dollars a movie mm-hmm. say one thing out your mouth while your eyes say something different yeah that <laughs> is movie star that's that is movie acting that's tv acting now mm-hmm. how do you uh you know that you play the opposite play two emotions at once one one vocally one you know visually yeah that's what you're trying to do that messes up your audience right that that's how you get uh you get into their into the into the pathos and to create a cathartic reaction in your audience because you have to go through something as the actor because that's what's real too because like if somebody asks you how are you doing and you're like okay you know you're not really you know, you're not really okay. You're just saying okay because right, right, right. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. just how we are in real life. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what we were trying to like recreate, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. We're uh, the difference between kind of like stage acting or performance acting and kind of film or TV is that the it's not about doing anything on film. It's about undoing it. It's about letting letting it affect you, and that's what we're talking about yeah. when you're saying. I'm okay, and you're really not okay. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's the that's the challenge. Those are the moments we live for. We, you know, as actors, we want to be able to first uh, get lucky enough to land a role that challenges us in that way, and then hopefully be in a situation where it's executable. You know, prof- you know, crew is is got is professional. Uh, production is professional, um, and then then you know. I always say that as an actor, they pay you for the waiting and all the bullshit. The acting part is what you do for free. That's yeah. your contribution, right? All the rest of it, going, getting flown somewhere or hanging out and, you know, having a late night, a fratter night, Friday night kind of call time or something. That, that's what they pay you for. The, the, but the acting part where you get to go out there and be like the Joker or you get to like do something <laughs> fun, grumpy. And, you know, uh, you know, swing a battle axe in Dungeons and Dragons, be a pirate or some. I mean, I've had a lot of ones that are super fun. <laughs> Warriors of Virtue, Kung Fu flying, you know, in China, whatever it is. Um, yeah. The fact is, I'm grateful every day 
I thank the universe for the opportunity. I make sure that um, I set my intention to have a good time. You're one of the lucky ones when you're working. So that's a big part of it. And then when you're, when you're in that mindset of very positive, very open, uh, I think good things can happen. Would you... Hi, folks. This is Michael Lee Collin the second from the podcast that you're listening to right now, along with manager Matthew Haas. You got promoted? Yes. Damn it. Okay. Anyways, um, folks, uh, do you like the show Superstore? Well, I don't know. I asked the folks and nobody's answering well, me because they're not here. Oh, but we love damn it. it. Yeah, we love it, though. Okay, folks, if you like it as much as we do. You're really going to like the Super Story podcast, which is a podcast where Matthew and I go uh, episode by episode and give our little opinions and thoughts on it. Uh, sometimes we have guests, sometimes we don't. Um, just depends on how we're feeling. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so if you like this podcast and like our little crazy banter, then you should definitely check this out. Or I might get sad. And when I get sad, it gets pretty sad. Yeah, so I can't deal with him when he's sad. Yeah, no one can really. So um Yeah. So, so check out uh Super Story Podcast right here where you get this podcast, Super Story Podcast. Would there be any like advice you'd give to somebody that's interested in getting into acting, or would you Don't do it? What that's are you that, crazy? That's what I, yeah, that's what I was wondering. <laughs> uh, but if you're crazy enough to do it, welcome to the club. Yeah. We're all we're all people that have been said no to a million times. Like why do you ha- why do you want to do it? I would be what question I would say why. Like what what if you're doing it for money? It's a stupid thing to do for money. Better off being a plumber. Better yeah. way better off being a plumber. Mm-hmm. But if you have stories to tell, welcome to the club. Yeah, we're all a bunch of misfits. You know, for many years, and it actually started in ancient days. Um, back in back in ancient Greece, and even ancient Rome. You know the 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 storytelling was sacred it was only really the rise of the church um as rival theater and you know then and and in the dark ages i mean the actors were vilified it was like you know that they were never allowed to own property that's when the comedian the traveling they were in the dark ages it was traveling telling bible stories but then you know later on um even in the 18th 19th century the court theater the shakespeare that was in elizabethan times still no actors or dogs allowed. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Dude, that, that sign, that sign was around in 1890, mm-hmm. you know, dogs or actors allowed. But the, what happened was when the movie screen came out, when the movies were invented, suddenly then we take on a larger role again. The sacred uh, is back. Going in a dark theater is more powerful than anybody's, you know, as the rival of the message. And this is what we now a hundred years or something later, we have to deal with cult of personality, like reality show influencers, all this social media. And it all started with the, the you know, the, the first film taking over and changing the dynamic where now we're revered too much yeah. as actors. Why do we care about it? And God, I don't know her and I've heard she was very nice, but like say Kardashian, or any of these reality stars are huge. TikTok stars getting giant movie deals, you know, yeah. that should be going to me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but but yeah. I mean that's just the nature of it. I don't I don't mm-hmm. um I don't uh, say discount or poo poo someone else's success. Oh yeah. Uh, but I also go like, well, that is the byproduct of this thing. That if I was going for a PhD in either theater study or film study, would be probably my thesis would be I would study this, the change, the vilification of the performer, because it rivaled the message of originally of the church. You know, um, I think now it's been co-opted by corporation and media and all this other stuff we could get into, like what would be the modern. I mean, there would be courses on this, I'm sure. In schools. Oh, yes. Yeah. So it's a, you know, it's a PhD level kind of thing that I'm definitely not, I don't have the brain for it, but um, as a performer, I've always could tie myself into the ancient performers. The Navajo, right? Yeah. The Navajo, famous blanket weavers, famous musician, right? If you ever look at a Navajo blanket, 
these intricate patterns always have one pattern that trails off the rug into infinity. That's called the spirit line. And the concept of the spirit line is that that rug, that pattern, that art is always going around in the universe. In the same way, when the musicians play their music, they start out soft, tapping into the spirit line of the music. Then they make the connection, bah, 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 and it comes up. So the spirit line is out there for all of us. We just need to see it, you know, and everyone's is different and everyone can find it. But, you know, the, the higher power of for everyone is available, however you want to define it. We can surrender outcomes as artists. We can surrender ego as artists. We can think about other people and wear freaking masks in a pandemic. Yes. But I mean, you know, whatever. I mean, I'm an actor. My my opinion is my opinion. It's no more valuable than the plumber. Yeah. But but I'm also can do plumbing. And that nothing is, is your your but your your opinion is still valid because I I hate it when I see things where people are like, "Oh, you know, why is that actor or musician telling me how to think?" They're not telling you how to think. They're just telling you how they think. Right. And that's Well, like, yeah. I never would listen. I, I think that's very, very important to share your own experience and not tell someone ever how to do their own thing because whatever they're doing has nothing really to do with you anyway, unless you're taking everything personally or making assumptions about everything. Right. It's hard enough. Life is challenging enough just to make it through the day. There's days when I have to grip hard on this earth with my toes. I feel the revolution. Like we're spinning. I don't know how fast are we spinning on the earth? <laughs> yeah, it's fast. The Earth yeah. spins fast. <laughs> yeah, it does. Think about it. We should all be flying in the air right now. <laughs> so those, and then I think that's what you know, what grounds our society. We learn this. You know, I feel like we're essential. We actors are essential. You know how I know that because as soon as content runs out on Netflix, they're freaking the fuck out. Yeah. Okay. We're essential. We're not before grocery workers, garbage men certainly healthcare, first responders, but we're not far after that mm -hmm. where to, we make society better, like to be entertained. If we didn't have acting and music and film and theater and everything, we would be video games. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. video games now are big money, theatrical yeah. stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, they're, they're just as, you know, essential as film and TV and everything. Uh, and I mean, and like, like you said, like if, you know, like I know that a lot of networks are now having to air things from other countries and stuff like that because of shutdowns and stuff. And no. so, so it's yeah. essential, obviously. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. The definition of essential really kind of is everybody. And to label anyone essential is it's it does point out the thing because like how many times do you think your grocery worker is the most essential? Yeah. But it's pretty essential. Didn't have your gas station dude, you're the guy that runs the tire shop. I think the guy that makes tacos for me and the restaurant and stuff, you know. Yeah, so I mean, I don't, it's an interesting time, brother. You know, it's yeah. like or maybe we didn't talk enough about sort of acting in movies. I'm always available oh, no. for that. Too. Oh, that's fine. But I, the, the I, world is I just, so crazy right now that I mean, I, I love talking about life in general, anyways. So, well, we're storytellers, man. I mean, as actors, we're relating like our own experience. You know, I live in a beautiful, beautiful place. Very, very lucky. Um, I made a move about a year ago out of the city to a little like slower paced area. And uh, it was lucky for me in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right. But I, right away, March, I did a convention the first week of March in Minneapolis, Minnesota, right when the first people we hadn't started, there was no, no lockdown, nothing going on, but I was aware of what was happening. And I wasn't masked at that time. No one was. No. A few people had them, a few. Yeah. March 1st, the weekend of before March 1st, I think was a Sunday. So maybe it was the Thursday or Friday I traveled. Anyway, when I come back, I, I did a two week quarantine just because I was like, I'm just going to lay low because I've been in airports and traveling at a convention yeah. with a bunch of people. Okay. Um, and then that whatever it was, was it Friday the 13th in March? It was March 13th. Yeah. Which would have been two weeks. Um, there's like a notification from my kid's school saying that one of the parents had it, oh, wow. but they wouldn't say who. 
because they couldn't legally. Yeah. And they didn't know if the kid had it. There wasn't enough testing. So then we did another two week because we said we could be the spreader. Yeah. And that's how it started for me. So mentally, right then at the beginning of March, I go, well, I mean, I could actually handle this better than most people because I can pretend to be an astronaut on the way to Mars. I can pretend to be a pirate sailing across the sea. You're not getting anywhere for a month when you're traveling the sea in a pirate ship. <laughs> Because the psychological effect of hanging home for a couple months drove people. It's like that's the, we're having a mental health tsunami in our country. I mean, because I'm an a I, I'm a essential quote unquote worker. Um, yeah. I, so so I've I, I only had to quarantine for a week because I came in contact with somebody and they made me contact. You know, so I couldn't leave my apartment. Did you get? A, uh, were you tested though? Um, no, they this was before they had the tests like everywhere. So they but. Uh, one of my coworkers had the had the virus, like probably this was back at the very beginning of everything. Well it was it was it was in California in November. People were real sick November, December, January mm-hmm. with a cough, with the same symptoms. They had it. So the virus was actually here a lot way before we knew it. Potentially it was in here, it mixed in with the flu, but the flu, because we're saying like, listen, it's only the flu, but imagine in 1918, the same flu that we now call it's just the flu wiped out millions of people. Yeah. 1918, right? So 1918, the last pandemic. So Corona is not going away. It's constantly mutating. It's a virus. Yeah. The the only hope with these, um, the so-called vaccine, it's another flu shot. They don't know it'll not cure because it's constantly. So chances are that'll be like going and getting your flu shot. Yeah. It'll be into the Walgreens run, you know. Hopefully it becomes that simple so we don't have all these people dying. It's just. Well, and, no, and, people, we, and, we, and we don't have, uh, you know, people denying the fact that it actually does exist, too. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I just don't think it's I just don't think it's common sense. I mean, I don't think we should be we should be smart about it because. If we had dealt with the pandemic first, uh, if we'd actually all just gone, hey, let's all for two weeks, let's chill out. Mm-hmm. America's not. I mean, we would lose World War Two right now, bro. We, no one's going to volunteer to do anything. We're lazy people. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're the most self-centered country ever. And it's because we you know that we were provided a lot of opportunity and we, we you know, we should be more generous with it. My humble opinion. Oh, yeah. And I mean, if we don't appreciate it, eventually it's going to go away, anyways. And then, I mean, it's going away. I mean, it is, and, and people are going to be surprised when it's completely gone, and they're not realizing yeah. that they were part of the problem. But well, well, I mean, we're all we're all part of the I problem. Mean, we all part. I mean, I'm just as much as anybody yeah. else. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Yeah, but I mean, listen, I'm just what I'm saying is like I don't. I'm not blaming. I'm accepting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my part of it. Like the other thing too. My big thing is this. You know, I live in California. We have like. You know, we have fires that are really horrifying, yeah. uh, now wiping out communities. I mean, it's really scary. And, and um, the the non-acceptance of that science is bothering me because I think that we're talking about it wrong. I don't call it climate change. I call it human extinction. Yeah. People go, oh, the Earth's in trouble. I, I mean, the Earth's not in trouble. It's the humans that are in trouble. Dinosaurs got in trouble. Like because of think you know what happened and and so it's, we're going the way of the dinosaurs if we don't wake up and realize that you know that is the issue. The Earth, if you've ever seen the, the you know what happens when humans are gone, yeah. the Earth regenerates very nicely. Yeah, I mean like, that, that's that's the thing. I mean the dinosaurs went away, we will go away, but the Earth will still be here. It's not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So let's you know, and we have the opportunity and storytellers. As science fiction buffs, as I don't know, I mean, it's just people that are like connected to other people to spread more of a message of that, of hope, of opportunity, of let's get it together. It's not too late. It's getting close. If we don't start doing stuff in you know right away, yesterday was too late, really. And hopefully, but I think we hopefully we change things for our future generations and you know right i mean i mean it's probably gonna be for my son's children that we're making these acts we're already sticking with them a giant debt mm-hmm. i mean i mean just a lot of craziness i I, don't, I can't go into the politics of it because i would you know oh, probably yeah. turn turn off at least 40 percent of your audience <laughs> uh, 
probably exactly 40 percent or 30 whatever the number is and i respect everybody Mm -hmm. but let's just all meet in the middle let's pick the best ideas um and uh let's go to let's go forth in harmony yeah we're a great nation our diversity is our strength and just give everyone their due you know men women whatever your orientation skin color who cares Mm -hmm. honestly honestly what's the what's the quality of your heart it's like the the whole uh you know like shylock where you know if you prick me i bleed and all that stuff you know it's what it is is we all bleed (laughs) absolutely absolutely and uh we all cry we all grieve we all want the best for our kids you know we're all the or i mean we are so much closer to being the same than to be different in, 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 and uh, that's my one of my jobs is to also you know point that out by playing, showing the humanity in these in some characters maybe or finding it right and whether it's common sometimes it could be it could be just finding a, a laugh that connects a the the Seinfeld humor yeah. with the Midwest yeah. you know with a Methodist family the Jewish humor of New York of Seinfeld with a Methodist family in Kansas yeah. or with, uh, you know, Episcopalian family in, in Idaho, whatever, you know, we're connected. We, we have yeah. more in common than we don't. That's Amen, yeah. brother. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't want to keep you too long. So thank you for your time and everything. And, you know, I'd love to talk to you brother, sometime. <laughs> anytime you know how to find me, yeah. it's great. If you have more questions, let's do his part two. We can yeah. go into more like the acting thing. I'm, you know, and uh, really enjoy it. It's, it was easy money. Uh, wish you all the success. Stay safe, you know, out there. And uh, keep in touch, brother, man. Okay, that was uh, my interview there with Lee Ehrenberg. Um, had a lot of good stories there. Um, what's on your mind today, Matt, before we close things up here? <clears throat> mm, not much. I mean, it was riveting, very insightful, like you mentioned earlier. Yes. Um uh not really a whole lot in my mind other than just uh just uh just, I don't know. <laughs> just just the world in general. Yeah. 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 So uh people be good to each other. Be excellent to each other, as uh Bill and Ted would say. And um <laughs> you know, just go out there, wear your fucking masks when you go outside, people. Um <laughs> I'm just going to keep saying that, you know, until we have a vaccine, until everybody's cured and everything's fine and everything's all rainbows and ponies and butterflies. <laughs> wear your fucking masks. <laughs> it's not that hard. Anyways, um, <laughs> it is. I got a, a one problem that I, I self-diagnosed. Well, then you shouldn't be at Walmart um, <laughs> or Kroger no. or wherever the fuck you are. Anyways, um, the. <laughs> <laughs> the um you know you shouldn't be there trying to kiss all the people in the grocery store uh, anyways um whoa. well wait <laughs> what <laughs> maybe that's just me anyways um the uh yeah i'm gonna leave some links in the show notes you know so that'll give you some organizations you can do to help with this covid shit and all the other uh, shit going on in the yeah. world, you know? And um, <laughs> hopefully this world gets back to basics and we all love each other again. Did <laughs> back we ever, to basics. Did we ever love each other? Anyways, um, <laughs> so where is the love? As, Fer- <laughs> as Fergie would say. Anyways, um, so uh, <laughs> anything on your mind here, Matt, before we uh, close this up? No, not really. Just what you said, pretty much. Okay. Well, <laughs> that's all for All Too Real 2 today. Bye bye Thanks for listening to All Too Real 2 Podcast, a Cullen Park production. Produced and edited by Michael E. Cullen II. Music by Matthew Hawes. Subscribe and share the show. Visit us at CullenPark.com.